few. Okay, that was quite long for question one. Uh, let's move on to question two. So we have activation energy. So this is to do with rate of reaction. And you want to determine activation energy. Determining activation energy is actually part of an uh, equation which you don't learn in um, in air level specifically. It's called the Arrhenius equation. Uh, but you will see from this experiment afterward anyway. So we use a pipette to transfer 10.00 cm cube. Ooh. So pipette does have two decimal place accuracy. So perhaps I was wrong to say that two decimal place must be a pirate. Um, I suppose if you had used pipette previously, they would have been all right as well. But you know, two decimal place, you could easily have used a pirate to transfer this. They would have been all right as well. You go into a boiling tube of this purple colored, intensely colored chemical form, potassium manganate 7. Use a second pipette to transfer that. Blah blah blah. This is the ethane diol weight. The other name is called oxalate. The other name for ethane diol weight is called oxalate ion. You might have heard of EN. You have heard of OX. These are ligands. These are ligands as part of your transition metal. A2 transition metal chemistry. They say usually you can abbreviate with these bidentate ligands. EN as well as OX for oxalate. EN is ethylene diamine. Two carbon and an NH2 and NH2 on either side of the two cupboard. Step 3, you got to place the boiling tube into the water bath. Um, so we use a thermostatic uh, water bath in order to control the temperature. And we allow the temperature to become equal and constant. You have, it's got to be constant before you start these experiments. You pour the ethane diode or the oxalate solution into the boiling tube. Containing that, we got to start the timer to stir during the reaction if you don't stir then they don't mix well then it might not be accurate uh, to reflect the actual rate of reaction when the reaction finishes so this is a this is actually in your as syllabus oxidation of ethane diuret ions under oxidation of carboxylic acid so this is part of your theory you know that this can oxidize this to give carbon dioxide and water and this itself will be reduced going from mn plus seven going to the colorless very pale pink mn2 plus solution that is when you know the reaction has finished stop the timer and record the time so you need a stopwatch and we're going to repeat this at different temperature each time we're going to ensure the temperature gets to a constant temperature before we start the reaction so student use the recorded data complete column one to three so this is in kelvin this is in second so we have one over t in kelvin so we're gonna do the reciprocal i get they ask us how many significant figure they don't tell us how many significant figure they just say complete column one to three actually there's no instruction here yet so i don't want to fill it in yet until they tell us there you go three significant figure three significant figure all values all right so three 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 so to i mean reciprocal of three 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 that is one over three 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 so that is point zero zero three hundred the number at the end there is three on my calculator below five so i stick to three significant figure the number of my calculator is three zero nine five nine so i add one and then i get this to three significant figure one two three The same thing here, it was 3, 2, 2, 5, so 5 or higher, therefore I have to add 1. So you should be able to do this fairly quickly. I'm just running out of breath now. Been talking for some time, this is log t, so log to the base 10 of 11. That gave me 1.04, this is to 3 significant figure, remember? 3 significant figure for all values. Even though time has a unit, when you take a log of something, log something has no unit at all. So log 35, give me 1.54. Okay, so that one's done. So an extra procedural step is required in order to be able to calculate the average temperature 
throughout each experiment. So what is the extra step that you need to take in order to work out the temperature? So if you want to get average temperature, you need to do one more step. This is the average temperature of reaction mixture. Uh, when they react, I guess. Mm, and you're assuming when they react, this constant temperature here, this constant temperature is when you first start, when you first start the reaction. So this is before reaction starts. Okay, you really need another uh, column. You need to record another temperature for the reaction mixture. Okay, so you need to record what happens after the reaction as well in order to see if the temperature reaction mixture changes at all. Because here you're assuming the average temperature reaction mixture is the same as the uh, constant temperature that you have above the boiling tube set to. And they are not necessarily the same at the end of the reaction. So I need to take another temperature reading take another temperature reading so that was initially before reaction takes place and uh, at the end of reaction remember we know it's the end of a reaction we stop timing when the color of the chemical four goes colorless all right uh, at the end of reactions uh, before averaging okay so complete the table, I already did that. Suggest one an experiment with an average temperature of 343 3 Kelvin is going to be less accurate than the other experiments. Why is that? So this is 343 3 Kelvin. 343 3 Kelvin is going to be higher temperature. As you see, as the temperature goes higher and higher, as the temperature goes higher and higher, the reactions go slow, uh, faster and faster. Okay, so faster reaction. When the reaction goes faster and faster, it takes shorter and shorter time for the KMnO4 to go colorless. As you can imagine, what was it just now? 70 degrees Celsius, 343 Kelvin. So this is already stretching into 11 seconds. When you have 343 Kelvin, it would drop below 10 seconds, probably single digit uh, time. So like as soon as you start the timer and then not long after that, you have to stop the timer. The shorter the time, the bigger is the percentage error in the time reading, okay? That's the problem with percentage error. The smaller the reading, the bigger is the error because you would know that the percentage error in time is to do with the error accuracy divided by the time taken time 100 percent we are using the same stopwatch for all the experiment so the error in a single reading doesn't change but the time when the time is so much shorter very very small such as the case at much higher temperature then this percentage error is going to be higher that's why they talk about less accurate because it's due with a bigger percentage error okay at even higher temperature which is 343 Kelvin should really use bracket instead of comma um, uh, time taken for reaction is much shorter and when the time taken for reaction is much shorter therefore percentage error in time reading is going to be higher Phew. okay next one identify the dependent variable if you watch my other paper 5 tutorials you know that um, there's a there's a famous phrase that I get from my friend why are you so dependent why are you so dependent okay so the y-axis is typically the, the, the dependent variable and the y-axis is what you measure Remember, we change temperature. So we change temperature and we measure the time taken for the reaction to, um, to take place for the, for the colored solution. Okay, so um, time taken, and you can say for, 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 um, um, for the purple color to get decolorized or for the reaction to occur, for the reaction to finish. To occur okay so there's a time taken from when it goes from colorless sorry when it goes from purple and then suddenly go colorless so there's the time taken for that reaction 
Okay, next bit, uh, plot a graph on the grid. So I will have my table of data on another piece of paper because uh, I can't keep going back and forth. Well, to be honest, there's only five, there's only five data. So maybe it's not too big of a deal. The X is already given. That's why this is only two marks. So be able to, now nah, I'm gonna rely on that other piece of paper because um, it gives me headache actually. And I've spent way enough time on this paper. So the most important thing in graph plotting really is you get to plot in the point. Okay, and put in this is going to be a linear plot because I've done Arrhenius plot a lot of times and I know it's going to be a linear equation. Um, let's get started. So we are plotting uh, log time against 1 over t. The log time is going to tell us, well, something. It's going to 1 over t. Uh, actually, this is not the Arrhenius plot. Arrhenius plot is something different. Uh, it's to do with log of rate, which is to do log 1 over t. So this is slightly different to Arrhenius plot, but I'm pretty sure it's still a linear equation actually. Okay, so um, 3.00, so here, okay, so this was 0 0.00300, that was your first point, and it's 1.04. 1.04 seems simple, well not really. So this is 1.10, so 1.04 must be 2 square above. So put a cross very clearly. Next one is 310 and 154. 310 and 154. 154 is there because 150 is there, 1.50 is there, so 1.54 is there. Uh, 317 and 188. 317, okay. This is 315, 320, so 316 is 2 square, 317 is 4 square from here. 317 and 188. 317 and 188. Uh, it's going to be there. Okay, so there's 1.88, there's 1 1.90. 323 and 2.16. 323 and 2.16. 323. 2.16, 2.10, 2.16 is there. Uh, and last one, 329 and 245, 329 and 245, 329. So 329 is going to be 2 square away. That's going to be there, 2 square away from that. 329 and 245, um, 245, 245. 2, 4, 5 is somewhere in between. So 2, 4, 0, 2, 4, and 5, 0. So 2, 4, 5 is somewhere in between. I'm going to remove the scale a little bit, make it a bit smaller. And then I can draw a straight line plot just like that. Okay. So there's probably a best fit straight line. So in fact, I would say all the points lie on the line actually. So be careful. This is not the y axis because this is not x equal to zero. So this is not your y axis. All right. Uh, okay. Done everything. Blah, 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 blah. Yep, done everything. So this is the equation for the line. R is the molar gas constant. But anyway, they give it to you. Not that it matters. Use your graph. Use your graph. Determine the gradient of the line of best fit. You got to state the coordinate. So very important. And your coordinate needs to be given to three significant figures. So let's read our graph. Not necessarily the point, yeah? Not necessarily the point. I'll probably pick this particular point because it's 0 0.00305 on the x-axis. Zero 0.005 on the x-axis. Nice and easy. And then it is this point here. So there is 1.28. 1.28. And then I'm going to choose another point on the line. Um, uh, I would probably go for this one because this one lies exactly on the line. So it's nice and easy to read. And this one is just one square above. One square above this. So that one is 2.02. .02. So something and then 2.02. .02. Mm, it is this one and 2.02. .02. It's easier when you have the whole paper in front of you. Uh, but life is not too bad when I'm working on screen because I get to copy and paste. I don't have to, oops, I don't want that. Um, okay. 
and I get to do this without having to redo it so it's not too bad actually so we saw that the gradient was definitely positive because uh, it was an upward slope so don't forget use bracket the difference in the y divided by the difference in the x okay remember that on your y-axis you have log time which has no unit and on your x-axis you has 1 over t 1 over t 1 over temperature has a unit of k minus 1 that's why your gradient 1 over k minus 1 is going to be kelvin so 2.02 .02 minus 1.28 do that first and then divide by bracket so the use of bracket is very important especially you know that we are well i am very careless on my calculator so run that up to three significant figure so i look at the fourth one this is one two three so i look at the fourth one this is below five so i don't add anything and then i just have zero at the end so this is three significant figure one two three determine the activation energy of this reaction again you gotta give your answer to three significant figure and they want you to include units all right so the activation energy well this is going to be a y this is going to be your constant and i hope you can see that that is your gradient because 1 over t 1 over t is your x-axis so this is y equal to mx plus c this is a linear plot as you would have learned from your maths a uh, long time ago at least i did y equal to mx plus c when i was in lower secondary um not too sure but it was definitely in the upper secondary curriculum anyway okay so the gradient was what we have calculated and the gradient is in kelvin this is joule per mole per kelvin so we're gonna be very careful with bookkeeping so ea over 2.303 rt is equal to gradient and the r the r is 8.314 per mole per kelvin i am just going to cut that and paste it down here because it's a lot easier when you have your paper in front of you um, i'm going to use not this value i'm going to use the slightly more exact value uh, for my gradient i don't think it matters that much if you had used for 930 i think it would have been all right because you are probably uh, being being assessed on whether you could uh, appreciate units or not in this question rather than your level accuracy remember r was 8.314 uh, was it 4 8.314 joule per mole per kelvin joule per mole per kelvin your temperature oops sorry 1 over t so it's just 2.303 times r okay because 1 over t is the x so the gradient is just ea over 2.303 R. this was joule per mole per kelvin the gradient was in kelvin so ea is going to be 2.303 times 8.314 joule per mole per kelvin times 4933.33 kelvin per kelvin time kelvin hopefully you can see that that cancel out and at the moment my answer is going to be in joule per mole but let's have a look to see whether the number is big or not and it's a big number it's actually 94 four, five, nine. i don't care about the decimal place because i know my final answer is to be to three significant figure anyway one more thing that we should remind ourselves the ea here has to be positive because your calculator did not show you and remember our gradient was positive and this has a positive number in front there's no negative so the m equal to ea over that thing is positive so positive equal to positive the ea has to be positive as part of enthalpy it has a sign value and unit but there's not going to be our final answer i need to run it up to three significant figure so i look at the fourth one because the fourth one is five or bigger i become have 94 500 joule per mole or i can convert it to plus 94.5 if you are not comfortable you can leave it as that and that would have been okay as well because that's exactly the same as that i just like to 
express my enthalpy in kilojoule per mole. Not that there's anything wrong with joule per mole at all. Alright, that's the end of this tutorial. 